Hi, welcome to the Sifu Mimi Chan Show. Thanks for joining the conversation. Hello, hello. Welcome to another Kung Fu podcast. Hopefully, those of you who have been listening thus far have been enjoying the traditional Chinese Kung Fu podcast that I've been putting out in terms of lineage. I've gotten into martial arts, sifus, and masters, as well as a little bit about my training regimen and what my basics regimen was and kind of the, the secret to Kung Fu. I should have titled the last episode that. And for me, the secret to Kung Fu was literally like the basics and working on the foundation. Today, I'm gonna talk about something a little bit more exciting for some of you might enjoy. Uh, a lot of times we have students who come into the school or uh, potential students who come into the school and they're really excited to learn everything that you're seeing behind me. So they want to know about all the weapons, they wanna know when they're gonna to get to learn the sword or the spear or the whip chain. And uh, unfortunately we have to break their hearts and let them know that'll be several, several years down the line. And so I thought it would be kind of fun since the last episode I did was so rooted in the foundation and the basics and embracing those ABCs that I would give a little bit of insight in into some of the more advanced training uh, for us here at Walam Kung Fu anyway. So for us at Walam, we really follow a very traditional curriculum. It usually takes about a year before you get to your first weapon, sometimes earlier if you are a avid uh, practitioner and you're training all the time, you come to a lot of classes. So uh, everybody's a little bit different. And for those of you who are joining me on video, you will see that I am here at the Walam Kung Fu Temple. Uh, so I am on site today. I'm not sitting in my gym at home. <laughs> Instead, I am in the very uh, dead heat of the summer inside a non-air-conditioned Kung Fu temple. So I'm really um, roughing it for my podcast. So I hope you guys appreciate it. <laughs> In any case, again, all of these weapons here are always really, really super exciting for practitioners. And for me in particular, there's a few weapons here that, that resonate. I remember that uh, first time I actually started my weapon, and I think I was under 10 for sure. Uh, I don't remember how old I was, but I remember about how high I was. And so my first stick was uh, not this stick, but this stick here, for those of you joining me online, is probably about the height of, of the stick that I had. Uh, for those of you who are joining me on video and can see the stick, you'll know that it has some significance uh, to me as a teacher. And so that's a little bit of an inside uh, inside lesson, inside joke there for some of my former students and current students. Uh, this is the, they, they call it the white stick, literally because it's just painted white and I don't really know why, but uh, it is a stick that we have here at the Kung Fu School and honestly it is my teaching stick. So I often uh, was found walking around with this stick, correcting stances and correcting students with it. And that's all I'll say about that because I think it can be, um, a little revealing as to uh, my teaching methods, but but the stick is a really important weapon here at um, Walam, but also in Chinese Kung Fu. There are four classical, there's 18 classical weapons, but there are four really important weapons, and that's the stick, spear, broadsword, and straight sword. So um, there's a book by my father, Grandmaster Chan, on the stick and the flute, but uh, we're talking about the stick today, and before this last, before this podcast, you know, I kind of called him and was kind of picking his brain, and and maybe one day he'll be kind enough to to join me on one of these podcasts, but not quite sure. I'll convince him, but he he sometimes humors me, and and he kind of gave me a little bit of a poem about the the four important weapons, and he, and my Cantonese is not very good, so you have to excuse me, but it's Do uh, Wai Fu Gim Wan Gim Wai Mo. Cheng Wai Sui and Guan Wai Fu again, or Zhou Fu. And that simply kind of translates into the uh, familial relationship of the weaponry. And so, for those of you who have done martial arts before, you know that our, the Kung Fu styles are very, very, um, the Kung Fu 
world is very, very much like a family. So I talked about it in the last few episodes, the importance of a Sifu, the importance of who they are in relationship to you basically becomes apparent. The Kung Fu brothers and sisters in your, um, in your, in your Kung Fu family are called as such. So literally you call someone older Kung Fu brother or, or younger Kung Fu brother, older Kung Fu sister, younger Kung Fu sister. So it's all very, very much family names. And the weaponry is very similar. So the stick uh, or the guan or um, in, in Cantonese it's guan and then in Mandarin it's more like gun. <laughs> so that is the grandfather of all of the weapons and its spirit animal is the dragon. And I like to say spirit animal, animal or symbol because for me I really feel like it embodies like what the weapon is about and what it entails but also like a little bit about the movement. So for anybody that has hopefully maybe followed me on IG, you'd see I've done a little bit of stick and spear movements and you can see that there's a lot of fluidity to it. I have a spear right here actually for you to see, for those of you who are joining online. And the spear um, especially really encompasses a lot of fluid and um, sneaky movements. And so I do think it encompasses the dragon, which is the stick and the spear spirit animal. And of course, this spear, we say king, but it also could be known as like the general. So in Chinese, I think a lot of those words and that titles can be a little bit um, in the old, old school philosophy, very interchangeable. So you may hear it as both, but basically it's, it's kind of on the, more on the, the military side versus the family side. And the stick is the grandfather because if you'll notice the stick and the spear have similarities. Basically the spear is a stick with a, um, with the, the blade on top of it, right? And so the grandfather of all weapons is because so many other weapons come from the stick. We'll see uh, the army sword, we'll see the Quan Do or, or um, the Munti shovel, the snake spear, the tiger fork, all of those are basically a stick with a, with a blade on top of it. And I think it's really fascinating because it's such a simple weapon, but at the same time, it is very, very versatile. So it's kind of interesting that from the stick, we get so many other variances of weapons and there is that basic. So once again, kind of referring back to that first episode where I talk about the basics and the foundation and how important it is, as you go into weapons training, it's equally, if not more so important that you have that, that stance work and your body movement foundation. But when you go into weapons, for us, the stick being the first weapon, being the grandfather, being the first one you learn here, makes a lot of sense because essentially, um, that will set you up for a multitude of weapons. So if you can hear that background noise, you know, I'm, I'm, out, in, I'm out in the nature I'm in, and I'm at the Wallam Temple and there might be some um, trucks coming by right behind us. Hopefully it's not picking up too much, but in any case, I got a little distracted there. Um, one of the things that I really love about the um, flute and stick book that my father wrote is a little bit of a, the history. And this is gonna be like storybook reading with me. And I think um, it, it was fascinating to me as I went back and reread this because I've read these books several times now. But the thing that's interesting was unique characteristics of primates, monkeys, apes, and humans is their ability to grasp sticks for use as tools and weapons, right? So just even thinking back to like the fundamental, like, basic of human capability is our gripping ability of a stick. And so it's just kind of telling that that would be the first weapon, that would be the grandfather of all weapons, and there's so much kind of depth to that. And I remember the first time that I learned stick, I was, I was excited like any other human would be to get their first weapon, but um, I just remember it, it feeling very natural, and I think that's just because I was able to kind of see it a lot see it in practice a lot. And so for practitioners, I think it's important to be kind of absorbed into the culture of what you're doing, into the tradition of what you're doing, and to you know, watch and observe. However, it is not okay to watch and try to learn from observing. Like that's why you have a Sifu, and that's why you get taught all of your movements. And, um, and for me, for sure, I think there was probably instances when I was little that because I was around it so much, I was able to kind of catch on and learn and kind of go past where I was supposed to. And then I was reprimanded um, 
pretty, pretty, pretty quickly for that. So another really cool thing that I learned while reading the book is the difference between, you know, the stick and the spear is that you'll see the depiction of the spear, as I said earlier, a lot in military settings, a lot in the army, a lot in the um, protection of the of the imperial palace and things like that, whereas the stick kind of, you think about like Shaolin temple, you think about stick. And the reason of course is because the Shaolin monks were kind of against violence and bloodshed. And so the sticks don't have that blade on the end, whereas of course the spear does and, and, and kind of, kind of showing that difference of being able to have this martial weapon for, you know, for practice, but for self-defense and for use, but not emphasizing kind of the bloodshed aspect of it and having that um, kind of that Buddhism and, and having that philosophy of, of self-defense and not attacking to kill. So I thought that was really interesting that they, they kind of became known for using the weapon to defend themselves against bandits um, and also against officials of the state. So you'd often see the stick versus the spear. And um, it was a really turbulent time, right? And so it was, it's really fascinating to me that we're looking at kind of back to, what, 377 AD, and, or, or maybe even before that, and if we're going back to primates being able to hold weaponry, that this many years later, thousands of years, that we're still holding on and utilizing these weapons in a traditional manner um, and, and kind of having that connectivity to the past. And I know that kind of goes back to episode, uh, the first episode where I talked a lot about lineage and, and having something that's deeply rooted. I think that's really unique to traditional Chinese martial arts. So in addition to the wellness and the martial aspects and the and the actual Kung Fu itself, for me, one of the things that's been important is really having that connectivity to something deeper and having that meaning behind everything you do. When we teach Kung Fu, we often talk about movement with purpose, movement with intent. And yes, that can mean like when you go to throw a punch, make sure you're doing it strong and with intention, like you're gonna quote unquote hit something or block like you're defending yourself. But for me, there, there's so much intention behind wielding a weapon that has thousands of years of history, that has a past, that has connectivity to so many different places over and spanning a period of time. I am not an expert in weaponry in terms of like the history and all the different types of wood that can be used. I am not a weapons maker. Um, I'm just an avid Kung Fu practitioner and a Kung Fu Sifu. And so thought it would be fun to kind of talk about a little bit about this today. So again, with the stick being the grandfather of all weapons, um, in Chinese philosophy, we also, uh, characterize the number of days it takes to quote unquote master the weapon. And I think it's a little bit deceiving because honestly, you don't really master anything. <laughs> you, you can get and achieve a certain level, but it certainly takes a lot more time and practice than, um, than what we kind of describe. So the stick is at a hundred days and that seems kind of minor. I do believe when they said master, I do believe they, they're talking like all day training. This isn't just like, Hey, I picked up the stick and I worked on it for like 10 minutes. So that counts as day one. So a hundred days to master is not too bad, which means, you know, it is, the foundation, there's basics to it. Um, the spirit animal or symbolic animal is the dragon and it is the grandfather, right? And so behind me, I specifically picked this setup for those of you who are watching on YouTube. For those of you listening, you can just imagine, I have a plethora of sticks behind me of all different sizes, of all different ranges and different woods. So we've got wax wood, we've got like bamboo rattan, we've got, um, uh, uh, hardwood in here somewhere and so they're all very very different and in all honesty over the years I think we have just a collection of it because practitioners have different preferences you know some of the um, some of the waxwood style sticks will have a little bit of flexibility to it even though it's very very firm there's still a bit, bit of a bend to it and so a lot of times people like that uh, 
the, the bamboo type sticks as well also has a little bit of flexibility. Sometimes they're finished. Sometimes they have kind of a polish on them. And some of the hardwood sticks and some of the other types of woods don't really have as much bend. So a lot of the modern martial arts like wushu and a lot of the um, uh, more modern prefer the waxwood because of that you know, flexibility. And a lot of times the spears are made with the waxwood. Uh, I think also to kind of emulate that you know, that dragon, <laughs> that dragon uh, movement. So there's a lot of flexibility in it. And it's really nice for sliding, which in spear, there's a lot of sliding. And so it makes it a lot easier because sometimes some of the other widths of the woods and the stickiness of them can be, can be kind of challenging. Um, and so today I'm really focusing in on, on kind of those differences, but also the similarities, right? So essentially, like I said earlier, you could literally take the blade and the, the horse hair and put it on a stick and be like, hey, now we have a spear. But, uh, but we do have different kind of variances in heights. A lot of people always ask, like, what's the right size for me? What's the right height for a stick? How tall should my stick be? And Really, there's, there's, there's so many different styles. So there are sometimes weapons that you can use as a short stick. There's short stick form. So there's some that should be short because it, it's specifically. There's also long. I don't know if the shot behind me can see, but way back there, there are master sticks, which are, I want to say, eight feet long or something. They're pretty long. And that's like super, super long pole, they call them. And then, but generally speaking, we like to have our students kind of measure to the top of their wrist when they raise their hand up straight. And that kind of for our basic wallum stick form anyway. I know every style is very different, but for our basic form, um, that's going to be a good height for you so that you have the range because it is a long range weapon. We consider this a long weapon. We consider something like a broadsword a short weapon. So it is a long range weapon. So you want to have that you want to have that distance for when you're doing when you're doing, you know, your your stick work. So so for a traditional like basic stick, we, we kind of say that that's the height. Again, there are forms that utilize the stick shorter and those are, that's kind of a sh short stick form, but we would still consider it a long weapon. And so, yeah, again, it's super personal as to um, exact height. If you're doing fight sets, we often make them a little bit shorter because just for functionality and for speed and for timing with your partner and distance, uh, sometimes the shorter weapons really kind of kind of play better, play better for camera anyway. So, um, so that's a little bit about the heights and a little bit about the different types of woods. And I actually thought about doing uh, a, a segment on the stick because my husband and favorite co-host of all time, Oscar, said that I should. He listened to me actually give a talk for a workshop I recently taught, and it was like a ground zero about stick, about the significance of it and, and how to utilize it. And he was like, oh, that whole intro you did on the history of it's really important. But naturally, because I like to be overprepared and I like to kind of look into things and it gives me a chance to go down that rabbit hole and learn a little bit more. I pulled the book back out and I was like, oh, what else can I share with my um, wonderful listeners on the stick? And in addition, I also called my dad and harassed him a little bit, which is always a lot of fun. Uh, one day I think I might record one of the, the phone conversations or video one of the times where I'm basically harassing him with all these questions and he's like, why do you want to know? I don't know. It's because that's the way it is. It's the philosophy, man. And then he'll tell me, don't you know, my Sifu would just sit there on his bench sometimes eating a bowl of rice or smoking opium or just sitting there watching. We didn't get to ask him questions. You're so lucky you get to ask me all these questions. I don't necessarily have the answer though. And I love that. I love that about my dad because he is not one of those masters who is a know-it-all, who's like, oh, wait, let me come up with a very uh, mysterious and mystical Kung Fu master answer. I mean, don't get me wrong, he's done that in the past, especially when it comes to things that have to do with good luck. When it comes to good luck, man, anything that he wants me to do, he's like, it's bad luck if you don't do it. You know, um, I know I'm tangenting right now, but <laughs> literally, 
Oscar and I, we love white rice, we eat rice all the time, jasmine rice only though, because we're, we're rice snobs. Um, but you know, there was a time we were like, okay, you know, we're, we're getting a little older, we need to like lessen our rice intake. Like we'll still eat rice, but maybe not so much. And he actually is the one that buys me my rice because he gets it from the special store and they know him and it's his uh, moment to say hello to people. And um, in all honesty, I'm really lazy and I hate going to the Asian grocery stores. So. Embarrassing, but uh, he, he, he was getting mad at us for not eating enough rice and he told us that it's really bad luck if you don't have rice in your home. So if your home is ever without rice, then it's bad luck and I'm not sure I buy that one. But when it comes to Chinese Kung Fu, weaponry, philosophy, and understanding, he has had so many conversations throughout his lifetime in his 80 plus years with masters from all over the world, but particularly in China with people that that don't have these conversations with anyone openly, right? He's built relationships with people that had a lot of lineage that really went close to uh, Wang Long and the praying mantis system and that had books and manuscripts and scrolls and things and you know he always said his big regret was that he didn't go to school long enough to be able to read at a high level because so much of the calligraphy I'm trying to look I'm, those of you online with me looking around because there's so much calligraphy here in the temple but I'm on a stationary camera so we can't like do a walking tour maybe next time uh, but he says they're, they're written at such a high level that he's unable to really um, interpret it and then explain it. So I think it's, it's kind of like when you know a language and you can understand it, but then you can't maybe translate for someone else. I think it's something similar to that where it's, it's written in, I like to always tell people, it's kind of like reading Shakespeare, right? It's like old English or, you know, something where it's, it's harder to kind of explain unless you've done the study, right? And so a lot of these manuscripts, a lot of these philosophies are really old, but they do come in the form of poems. And, and I love that when I called him today, he shared that poem that I butchered and read earlier for you, but it, it, it just, it's so meaningful. And I'm trying to ask him more questions like, well, why? Well, why is it this? Well, how? And then he just shuts me down and says, you don't get to ask the Sifu all the time. And so not that I want to shut down students from asking questions, but at the same time, it's sometimes because that's the way it is, right? That's the culture and the tradition that's passed down. And when you're talking thousands of years ago, honestly, do we really have that answer? Like, I know that there's, there's resources out there on Wikipedia that might disagree and call the sword a different animal than I'm calling it, or maybe not any, or call it, you know, or say it takes X amount of days and stuff. And, and it may, it may be different from what I'm saying, right? but I'm going by my family style. So to me, it doesn't really matter what's, what's being kind of expressed out there because I do know where my father got his information from, that he is a source, that he is very, very knowledgeable. And I'm so grateful that I've been able to literally, like right before I recorded this, just call him and ask him all these questions. And him to basically laugh at me and yell at me a little bit and then just say, it's fine. Just because I said, that's, that's the poem, that's the way it is. So there's not always a reason. I think I've told this story before, but my mom was also one time asking a bunch of questions about the praying mantis system and about like the connection between, you know, maybe this type of mantis hook or, or plum flower to the, you know, um, to the seven star, like how, how is it all related? He goes, oh, I know what you can do. And she's like, what? He goes, call up Wang Long and ask him, which for those of you who are martial artists know that is the founder of the praying mantis system who, you know, allegedly had studied a mantis movement, uh, you know, and, and, and couldn't defeat his opponent at the Shaolin Temple. And after studying this, learned all these moves, came up with his style. And so like, there's this fable behind behind, not fable, this is what we believe is, is, is what happened, but, you know, there's stories about, like, this master and from, you know, hundreds of years ago, and my dad's answer to my mother was, oh, you want to know about the plum flower versus the seven star mantis, you know, um, versus wrestling hands, well, you know, call up Wang Long and ask him, and it's such a, it's such a, it's such a Grandmaster Chen thing, right? It's such, a, it's such a my father thing because he is very much, to me, 
the best resource for information, but at the same time, he's humble enough to admit when maybe we don't have that answer, and maybe it's, it's just unfortunately one of those things that's kind of lost in time, and for us to just continue that practice and keep the spirit alive of it, and to just carry on the tradition and, and not always have to question every single thing. I think with the age of the internet, so much is accessible to us, but honestly, I don't know about those resources necessarily, right? I don't know about the manuscripts they're reading versus my father literally, you know, knowing the, the masters in the Chen village where the Chen Taiji was originated. Like when we went back to China, he has this relationship with that family line and unfortunately a lot of them are now gone. But in 2001, we took a tour and and it was one of those days where half of the students were like, I want to go shopping and buy souvenirs. And we're like, absolutely, you should do that. We want to be able to provide kind of a well-rounded tour because in the 80s and the 90s and the 2000s, we would be taking tours every other day to China, every other day, every other year to China. And one of those times, you know, we had kind of a, a split where we said, some of you, if you want, we're going to go to the to a, a Tai Chi village. Everybody else can go shopping. And the majority of the, um, I think it was like 60 something people went shopping. And then like a very small handful of us went on the huge bus over to the Tai Chi village, which happens to be the the place where Chen Tai Chi was, was originated, and, and I don't know if it's like right there, but the family, the lineage of Chen Tai Chi was there. And I kid you not, we are driving down a highway, then it becomes like a small town, then it becomes a single lane dirt road, then it becomes us driving through a cornfield. I don't know if it was corn, but in my mind, that's what it looked like. It literally was just like, you know, I high level of shrubbery, again, I don't know my, my vegetation very well, but it was like we're in the middle of a cornfield and all of a sudden this huge motor coach bus makes a left. And in the middle of this is this village and we met the most incredible Chen Taiji masters and we were privileged and honored to be in the presence of this excellence and tradition and um, and we and we never actually went back there again and again like I said so many people have passed away but but these are the experiences that are priceless and that are hard to replicate by someone just going on Wikipedia and maybe reading a book from a book from a book probably even from from this book and trying to gain that knowledge of Harry, here's what happened, here's what they said. Whereas I know that my father was in the room with a lot of the people that have generations and generations of storytelling. And and isn't that what what this is anyway? Is stories being passed down and you know hopefully they retain their accuracy, but they are just stories being passed down. And the thing about it though is that we practice the best we can with the best intentions and and what's kind of cool about this book in particular that I'm looking at for those of you who are watching on YouTube is that, you know, kind of breaks down like, okay, well, in the Ming Dynasty, we're talking 1360s, you know, the, the, the Shaolin Temple really, you know, kind of started to become famous, started to become famous for its fighting arts. And, and, and at that time, this is also where our fourth generation grandmaster was studying as a, uh, a warrior monk and he learned techniques from the Shaolin monks there and and here it says when his side lost in their attempts to expel the Manchus he shaved his head and became a monk of the Wallam monastery in Shantung and as mentioned earlier Qin Yong then passed on that style to Lei Quan Shan who then passed it on to Chen Pui, which is my father. So it's just really cool to be able to kind of see like there's this direct lineage. Um, I talked about the importance of lineage last time. I talked about the importance of knowing you're connected to something deeper and greater and remembering where you came from and knowing your roots. But I love that this is kind of just very simply laid out about the history of the stick and how like that has literally come into us today. And so then now my father passed that on to me and then now I get to pass on the knowledge 
that I have and I continue to try to grow and learn from um, to my students. And I have students now who have certified in what we consider our system and they're passing it on to their students. And so this is where we have generation and generation and generation that continues on and that's super inspiring. And it has been a really tough few years, but even these last few months, a lot of you who follow me and listen to this podcast know I've had quite a few rant episodes. I've had quite a few things that drive me insane, but I really enjoyed doing these episodes and podcasts on the Kung Fu tradition, on some of the stories that I've been privileged to be a part of, and I hope that you're enjoying them too, and I hope that they do bring you a little bit of inspiration, a little bit of a break from the noise, and a little bit of connectivity for those of you who are Wallum practitioners, for those of you who are martial art practitioners. Even still, like we consider all of, all of you part of a, a unit and a family in a sense that we are all doing something that is positive for ourselves, that is in betterment of ourselves, and that is in constant, you know, seeking to just improve, right? And so like betterment of oneself is what my father always says being a, a good Kung Fu practitioner is. And I know that I can veer off that path as I give in to anger and the dark side, but something like the grandfather of all weapons, the stick, uh, really roots me. And a lot of times I know it's called staff, but my dad calls it the stick and so that is what we do, but uh, for sure, I needed a little bit of that routine, so thank you for listening to me go on and on and on about it today. If you enjoyed this, let me know. I'd love to hear from you. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm just going to keep doing them because, as I said, there's four main weapons. We talked a bit about spear, but I didn't get too far into it today. Uh, maybe next time. And uh, we have a lot of weapons here at the temple to cover. So if you love this, let me know so I can uh, continue on. And uh, those of you who have reached out, thank you so much for your encouragement and for your comments. It is meaningful. Those of you who don't like it, you're, you're open to your opinion. That's fine too. Uh, but I want to give a special shout out and gratitude to all of my patrons who help support this podcast. It has been very challenging, to be honest, to get these out every single week. Uh, I don't have a huge team, but thanks to my patrons, I have a team, which makes it a lot more uh, feasible for me to get these, these podcasts out to you, but it also makes it feasible for me to do the work I do in the community uh, for all the causes that you know that I have been supporting and working towards. So huge shout out. Thank you so much to all of the patrons that support me on Patreon. If you'd like to be one of them, you can sign up. Uh, the link will be uh, on this website, but also in the show notes. So thanks, everybody. Have a great day. That's all for today's episode. Thanks for listening to the Sifu Mimi Chan Show. You can become a patron of the show at patreon.com slash Sifu Mimi Chan to help keep this podcast going. Follow me and interact on social media at Sifu Mimi Chan on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook.